provide those free of charge to the public because of support from the foundation. Duke's Pine Foundation is uh, registered, um, and you can find it with any database that has 501c3 foundations, and you can donate to help support us. None of the money goes to me personally. All right, are we ready to get started with our PowerPoint? Okay. So, this is our first slide, guys. No. All right, so this is our first slide. Why do injured facet joints hurt? What is a facet joint? Well, the spine is made up of bones, and between the bones are joints. The joints, like any other joint, allow movement. Movement of one bone with respect to another. Now, it's because of joints that we're able to move our neck and back, twist and turn. How come I don't see my picture up there anymore? Once you're on the PowerPoint, you don't see your mouse. Okay. You can see your mouse Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so that movement of our necks and lower backs that allow us to turn and look over our shoulder, or side to side, up and down, and then lateral bending, all that movement is occurring between the vertebrae, or bones, and the spine. And there's really two types of joints in the spine. One of them is called the disc, and the second joint is called the facet joint. So let's take a look uh, at the facet joint. I want to direct your attention first to the plastic spine model picture on the right side of the screen. What you're seeing here, the white is actually white bone. This is a vertebrae. It has a vertebral body, which is this big part in the front of the spine. Then it has a pedicle here, and then it has a facet joint. This is called the inferior facet joint. Inferior means bottom. There's also a superior facet joint up here. And you have the lamina, which is here, and the spinous process here. So these different areas of this vertebrae bone have different names. And one of the first things you learn in medical school is you learn how to name the bones in the body. You learn all the different names, but you also have to learn that even though each bone has a name, each part of the bone has names too. So it's kind of like a map of the earth, right? You have a country like, you know, the United States. And this part of the United States over here is California. This part over here may be, you know, Florida. And you've got Mississippi. So just like, you know, land masses have different names for different areas, well, the bones in your body have different names for different parts of the bone. And it's important because these different parts of the bone have different functions. I hope everyone can see my arrow. The yellow thing right here, it looks like a yellow spaghetti, is actually a nerve, nerve root coming out of the spine and going down into the arm, in this case. Uh, or leg if this is in the lower back. So if we're talking about the part of the spine in the neck, this would be a nerve going into your arm. If we're talking about the part of the spine in your lower back, this would be a nerve going into your legs. All right? So all the nerves that go down your leg, for example, from your buttock down to your toe, those nerves start in your lower back part of the spine. They actually really start way up in your brain stem. Actually, they start in the we're what are called alpha motor neurons, but the signals that come from the brain travel from the brain stem through the spinal cord, and then they communicate with little nerve cell bodies inside the spinal cord um, near where these nerves exit the spine. I'm trying to keep it simple. I don't want to get into too much neuroanatomy. That's not going to be helpful to you. But if you look carefully here, coming off of the nerve root is a little branch of the nerve. And this nerve right here is called the medial branch of the posterior or dorsal ramus. Okay? We call it the medial branch of the dorsal ramus. You can call it posterior dorsal. They're just two different Latin ways of saying the same thing. Posterior refers to a directionality that the nerve moves. If the nerve came off here and moved this direction, we call it anterior. If the nerve came off in this direction, it's called posterior. So I'm not trying to be tricky with the name. The name is not what I gave it, but that's the standard name for this nerve. Medial, because it heads towards the medial, towards the midline, from the lateral, which is out here, towards the 
midline branch because it's a branch of the dorsal or posterior ramus, okay? So this little nerve right here is very important. This nerve carries painful signals from this joint called the facet joint. It carries it over to the nerve root and then up to the brain. So any kind of inflammation inside this joint, which is facet arthropathy, arthrosis inflammation, gets transmitted to your brain via the medial branch of the posterior ramus, okay? So this is important because if this little nerve wasn't there, you wouldn't feel the pain in your joint. And I'm getting somewhere with this. It's going to turn out that the treatment for a painful facet joint is to go in with a special kind of needle where we can heat the tip up and it literally destroys this nerve. We, we cut it in half using that uh, radio frequency or rhizotomy probe. So Dr. Patel is my partner. He's an interventional pain management doctor. In my opinion, he's probably the best in the United States and one of the best in the world. Dr. Patel is able to take a patient and place a needle right next to the spine, right in this exact spot using an x-ray machine to look for this bone and this bone here. And he puts the needle tip right here and he heats it up to 80 degrees Celsius using a radio frequency generator and some wires connected to the needle. And he'll cook this little nerve and it'll kill the nerve and it'll kill the pain coming from the facet joint. Seems barbaric, but that's actually the best treatment available today to get rid of pain coming from a painful facet joint. So why are we talking about facet joints anyway? Why are they important? They're important because they're the first or second most common cause of chronic pain from a spine. So a lot of people talk about neck pain, back pain, but they don't understand where the pain's coming from. We do. The pain comes from, most commonly, a facet joint or a disc herniation. One of those two or even both of them. And a lot of times people will get an injury to their facet joint and that pain will go undiagnosed and untreated for years because the doctor doesn't know that the pain's coming from the facet joint. So the patient has to live in pain. That's not fair to the patient. So that's why we do these talks. We want to educate people so that they'll spread the word and then people don't have to suffer with chronic neck or back pain anymore. They can get it fixed. We can cure it now. Unfortunately, most people don't know that. They don't realize we're able to cure neck and back pain. Believe it or not, there's actually people out there that believe we haven't landed on the moon, right? They think that um, for whatever reason, and I won't make excuses for them, but they believe that, that we never sent a, a spaceship to land on the moon. Okay, why am I talking about this? I'm talking about it because most of us know for a fact we've landed on the moon, and we accept that as truth, and it's not even something that we debate. But I'm telling you, there are many, many, many people, millions of people out there that don't accept for a fact that neck pain and back pain can be cured. And so right now there's this kind of battle going on, right, between the people who know that neck and back pain can be cured. And by the way, there's a very small number of people that actually know that neck and back pain can be cured. And then there's all the people who believe that's nonsense, that it can't be cured. And so Duke's Pet Institute is leading the charge of the small group of people who know that neck and back pain can be cured because we've cured it thousands of times. But again, thousands of people being cured of neck and back pain in a world full of billions of people is a small number. So that's why we do these broadcasts. We want people to know that it can be cured. Now, we're not going to convince everybody, and that's okay. That's not my life's job. My job is to spread the word as best as I can, and then you all decide for yourself whether or not you want to believe it. But we're here to try to teach, and uh, hopefully we're doing a good job of that. So let's go on to the next slide. Now, there are facet joints in the neck and the thoracic spine and the lower back. So your entire spine, from the base of your skull to your tailbone, has these little facet joints that we talked about right over here, okay? Remember, facet joint, F-A-C-E-T joint. One of the two most common causes of pain is arthritis inflammation in that joint. So let's take a look at what an x-ray looks like when 
the doctor gets an x-ray, how do we know where these joints are? Because the x-ray is really the only way to see the joints. You have to do an x-ray to see the joints. So here's a lumbar spine, and this rectangle here is the vertebral body, okay? And this big circle here looks like a clock face, and there's another one on the other side. These are the left and right pedicles. Pedicles. Pedicle is like a cylinder of bone. It's got a hard outside and a soft center. And the pedicle is what connects the vertebral body, the big rectangle in the front of the spine, to the parts in the back of the spine. Okay, those parts being the transverse process, the lamina, the spinous process, and importantly, the pars interarticularis, and the inferior facet, and then the superior facet. Okay, so you have the superior facet, you have the inferior facet, and then if you look up here, the vertebral body higher up, okay, has an inferior facet right here, okay? I know it's hard to see, but this, this funny structure right here is actually the facet joint. And this is where you can see a little crack right there at the top of the arrow. There's a little white space. That's the joint space between the two facets. Same thing over here. You can see another one on the other side. It's this joint that gets injured and causes inflammation. It's that joint that causes pain and stiffness. So if you have a painful stiff back or a painful stiff neck, this joint is probably involved, the facet joint. Good news is we can fix that kind of pain, usually without surgery. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah. Sorry about we're having some sound technical issues. Remember, this is our first one, so we're going to be playing around a little bit to get it right. Be patient with us, please. Look my cup. Let's see who we have here. We've got, I think this is, is that Snow White? And that's Ariel, right? Or is that Belle? Ariel, I'm being told. Cinderella? And then I think maybe Belle after that. Oh, over well, here is Jasmine. For those of you wondering why I drink out of a Disney princess cup, this is a joke that my my employees play on me. They call me the princess, you know, because I gotta have everything just right the way I want it. That's okay. I've got broad shoulders. I get them back. I'm putting a giant spider in the nurse's bay that's going to sit over their heads for the next month and just stare at them. I have my ways of getting them back. Right, Sonny? No. <laughs> Sonny knows. How's the voice? Is it better now? Sorry about that. We're trying to... Since this is our first little... Uh, is this called a webinar? What webinar. do you call these things? Webinar? We, uh, we're trying to work through some of the little technical issues to make the experience better for you. Perfect. All right. Hopefully you all feel that that was an improvement. All right. So what do I do here, Sonny? Oh, sorry. I put the switch back. By the way, if you have questions during the presentation, type them up and I'll answer them for you. That's why we're here. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. What's going on here? Once again, um, for those of you interested in knowing the details, you can actually see the facet joint right here, and there's some dark stuff in it. This was injected into the joint. This is called a facet joint injection. And this dye right here is being seen in the x-ray because uh, x-rays are radiation that pass through the body. and We use x-rays in medicine all the time to be able to see internal structures or bones. And since bones are so dense with calcium, the x-rays don't penetrate the bones very well. So you end up getting a picture of what's blocked, the x-rays that are blocked basically from passing through the body. And the parts of the bone that are denser block more of the x-rays, they appear darker. So what's happening right here in this facet joint is you've got all this darkness in here. This is the dye that we injected 
so you can see the, the needle here in the syringe and it's puncturing through this membrane this white thing and that's really um, called the synovial membrane it's a covering outside of the facet joint remember I told you facet joints are diarthrodial joints so this yellow thing is the bone and on the surface of the bone you can see cartilage right here and then again the next joint above has cartilage as well that's the white stuff and so the joint has a membrane on both sides it wraps around the joint and when you inject the dye into the joint the, the dye is held into the joint by the membrane so the more damage a joint has the more tears in the membrane the more dye will leak out if you look over here you can actually see the nerve root and the dye is leaking and tracking along the nerve root now if this is the L4 pedicle then this would be the L4 nerve root passing underneath it and down the leg. And you can see the dye on both sides of the nerve root, there and there. So the dye leaked out of the facet joint, leaked onto the nerve root. What's incredible is that we're the first in the world at Duke Spine Institute to describe the fact that arthritis of the facet joint can actually um, get the nerve root because the nerve root runs right past the facet joint, out the foramen. And so inflammatory processes that affect the facet joints can also cause nerve pain. You see, it's fascinating because that's not something that's taught to doctors. All of my teachers, all the books, all the research, all the people that are knowledgeable in this area around the world, they've never even thought about this. But it's absolutely true. The nerve root runs right, basically right in front of the facet joint. So inflammation in the facet joints, which a lot of people ignore and don't pay attention to that causes back pain can also cause leg pain through inflammation on the nerve root. And we've shown you that during some of my open surgeries over the years. All right, here's uh, on the right side is another x-ray. This is an oblique view, meaning that we don't take a picture through the spine front back or side to side. We actually come at an angle. And what you can see here quite nicely, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you once the cursor comes back because it disappears from time to time is you see this right here this little pointy thing that is the superior facet this is the facet joint this is the inferior facet right here of the vertebral body above now we have a special name for this it's called the scotty dog all right why is it called that it's called the scotty dog because it, the early radiologists thought that um, this was the eye of the dog and this was the the nose or schnauz of the dog this was the dog's ear. This was the neck of the dog. And the inferior facet is like the front paws of the dog. And the body of the, uh, the dog would be the lamina. And then the, uh, the rear legs would be the uh, other side's inferior facets. Okay? And of course, the tail would be uh, right over here, it would probably be the transverse process. Uh, but the point is uh, a fracture. Uh, Scotty dog fracture basically would be a fracture through the pars right through here okay and so you can see a fracture in this area but it's not as important today in this uh, modern day because we have cat scans it's much easier to see fractures on a cat scan and we don't use the terminology Scotty dog fracture anymore that's kind of an older terminology point is if you look right here you can see a needle and dye going into the facet joint so you can see the facet joint nicely here, but you can also see it here. And this is all dye that was injected into the joint. We do this because we want to sometimes inject these joints with numbing medicine to see whether or not they're causing pain. The same thing can be done in the cervical spine or neck. You can inject the joints. You can see how the dye is leaking out of the joints and getting around the nerves of the spinal cord. This is another lumbar. And again, we're just numbing up the joints. Now, this is a rhizotomy. This is a procedure that's done to treat back pain or neck pain. Now, you can do this in the neck, the back, or the thoracic spine. But your doctor has to know how to do it properly. It can be risky if it's not done correctly. Most pain management doctors, interventional pain management doctors, are taught to do it in the lower back. Very few are taught to do it in the neck or thoracic spine. At Duke Spine Institute, we're able to do rhizotomies in the neck, thoracic spine, or lumbar spine, lower back, because Dr. Patel was very, very well trained. As a matter of fact, Dr. Patel is actually one of the national testers 
for the American Board of Interventional Pain Physicians. So he actually is the one who observes doctors that have finished their training and want to go out and practice in the real world. They want board certification. They want the highest level of certification. He's one of the testers. That's because he knows exactly what he's doing. He's very good at it. But uh, what I'm getting at is not all doctors know how to do these procedures. Very few actually do. So you want to make sure you go somewhere where they know what they're doing and they do a good job. Otherwise, you're not going to get better and you can actually get worse from the procedure. So here's a little cartoon down here showing you what's happening. There's a little cable, right, a little white wire. It carries electricity. It connects to the probe. The probe is metal. The tip of the probe is sitting right on that, that sensory branch that we talked about earlier that carries the pain signals from the inflamed facet joint to the brain saying, ouch, this hurts. And you can see the tip of the probe is sitting right on that nerve, and the uh, operator, the doctor, is going to heat up or turn on the electricity, the current will go down to the tip, it'll heat up the tip to about 80 degrees Celsius. And then the probe will burn that little nerve right there. That's what we want to do. That's how we cure the pain from facet joints, is by deadening the joint so you don't feel the pain, okay? Now, we got a question for you all. We're going to call it a poll question. We're going to poll the audience, people watching. What is the most common cause of chronic neck or back pain? Um, so, in all fairness, I told you that facet joint pain and disc herniated disc are about the same frequency. Uh, but facet joints are probably a little bit more common. So, I gave you guys the first answer. Um, the facet joint injury is the most common cause of pain. Okay? We're going to talk about almost an equally common cause of back and neck pain, which is a problem with the spinal disc called the intervertebral disc. The problem we're talking about is when you get an injury to the disc, it can be very painful. Let's take a look at the normal anatomy of a disc. So coming over here, I told, told you earlier, this big part of the vertebrae is called the vertebral body. And attached to the back of the vertebral body is the pedicle. And then Behind the pedicle, you have the superior facet, you have the spinous process, and you have the transverse process, and you have the inferior facet. Now, the vertebral body below, or vertebrae below, has the same exact structure. Slightly different, but pretty much the same exact structure. Between the two vertebral bodies is something called the intervertebral disc, and it's a giant cushion. And the reason you have a cushion between these two bones is so that the bones can actually move without grinding on each other and that you can carry things and load the spine with heavy weight by carrying a 100-pound dumbbell. Well, that 100 pounds is transmitted right through that cushion. Now, imagine if you had bone on bone and no cushion. It would be 100 pounds of force grinding bone on bone. Your spine wouldn't last a day, honestly. So these discs are very important shock absorbers or cushions between the bones in your spine. Injuring the disc can cause severe pain and dysfunction of the spine. And that's what Duke Spine specializes in, fixing injured discs. So let's take a look here. One more thing to note is this space. I'm going to outline it for you with my pointer. So we're, we're looking at the normal spinal segment on the left and my pointer is going to outline a space right here. You can see this yellow thing inside the space. That's the spinal cord and this space right here is where the nerve comes out and it's called the neuroforamen. It's very important, the neuroforamen, neuroforamen. It's a space where the nerve comes out. Now, I want you to look at this carefully because this is a very important picture. This is normal spine. You have a disc, okay? The spinal disc, which is really the back of the disc, makes up the front of the neuroforamen in the bottom half of the foramen. So if we drew a line across the foramen here, and this is the front, this is the back of the body, back of the body, front of the body, the back of the disc would make up the front, bottom, bottom half, of the foramen, but the front of the bottom half of the foramen is the disc. Very, very important. The top half of the foramen 
in the front is the back of the vertebral body. See right there? Very important. Almost nothing happens here. Almost everything happens here. Okay? Now, the only thing that would cause a problem here in the anterior or front top half of the foramen is a vertebral body fracture. And that happens in people with osteoporosis or tumors. It weakens the spine, this fractures, and it retropulses bone fragments backwards. Now, very important, look at the top of the foramen from here to here. What is this? This bone is called the pedicle, the pedicle. So a lot of spine surgeons don't even know this stuff, believe it or not. I mean, I could ask a surgeon and they wouldn't know. Like literally, if I had a guess, I'd say seven out of 10 don't know this. It's sad, but it's important for them to know, but they don't really think about it because it's not really taught to them. The top of the foramen is the pedicle. The bottom of the foramen is the pedicle. And now let's look at the back of the foramen. What's back here? You have your inferior facet, your superior facet, but importantly, you have this. This is the facet joint. That's the joint or space, like a knee joint between two bones. The bones are the top vertebrae, the bottom vertebrae. That's the facet joint. Now this facet joint in every single human being alive, over time gets bigger. It hypertrophies, it gets bigger. And you get problems with that joint. What are the kind of problems? Well, the capsule, remember we looked at the capsule? So let's go back, okay, and look at the capsule. Okay, so right here, you see this capsule, this white thing? And we saw it also right here. See the capsule? This capsule, we call it a synovial capsule. That capsule gets bigger as the years go on and your inflammation gets bad in those joints. The capsule enlarges. And as it enlarges, the capsule actually starts to push on this, the nerves and the spinal cord. And it causes what's called spinal stenosis or narrowing. So spinal stenosis or narrowing of the neural foramen can happen from a disc bulging backward. It can happen from bone spurs growing off the back of the, di of the disc. It can happen from fractures of the vertebral body. It can happen from enlargement of the facet joints. And it can happen too if this disc collapses. Because what happens if the disc collapses is the bone above collapses down onto the bone below. So the top to bottom diameter of the foramen collapses. Okay? It can also happen with stenosis if you have a short pedicle. If this part of your body is short, if you were born with a short pedicle, this whole area will be narrow. So there's a lot of things that cause spinal stenosis. Okay? There's another one which I haven't shown you because it's not in this picture. It's called the ligamentum flavum. The ligamentum flavum moves out into the foramen and it actually can get thicker over time and start buckling. And that ligamentum flavum is in the top back half of the foramen. So they don't show it in this picture, but it's there. Okay? The nerve root comes out of the foramen and it runs right behind the disc. So th let's talk about the disc. The disc is a shock absorber. The disc that I'm referring to is called the intervertebral disc, other otherwise known as the spinal disc. Um, so the disc has really fundamentally two parts to it, two very different parts. It has this weird gelatinous center that's called the nucleus, all right? Nucleus kind of means kind of the center of something, the nucleus. And it has a very strong fibrous, tough fibrous annulus. The annulus has about 24 layers of collagen that wrap around the nucleus. And it's really strong and really tough. But somehow we as humans, with our activities, trauma, motor, motor vehicle accidents, falls, we end up sports injuries. We end up traumatizing or damaging the disc. And you can have a tear in the annulus that goes from the middle or center of the annulus, like the inside layer, all the way through to the outside layer. And when that happens, it allows this nuclear material, the nucleus jelly stuff, to squeeze out through the tear. And we're going to see that in a minute. Now, where is the most susceptible place on a disc to have a tear? It turns out the most susceptible place on a disc to have a tear is in the back to the side. And the reason for that is actually anatomical. There is a ligament that runs from here to here. Okay, from here to here. And notice I didn't say over here. 
It runs from here to here. It's called the posterior longitudinal ligament. That ligament strengthens the annulus right through here. It's like a reinforcement wall. It's almost like a one of those nuclear doors that, you know, they're huge. They're like eight feet thick and they just, they're impenetrable. So um, the posterior longitudinal ligament gives support to the back of the annulus. This is the back, by the way. This is the front down here. So it's very common to see tears and herniations to the side of the ligament, which is right through here. Well, guess what this area is? This happens to be the neuroforamen. Remember we looked at it earlier? Okay, the neuroforamen is the space. See the disc? The back of the disc is the neuroforamen. So the back of the disc is the neuroforamen. That's where the nerve exits, right through there. So the weakest part of the disc happens to be the place where the nerve is. Don't ask me, I didn't design it. But obviously, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, not so good. Maybe in another million years, this part will be reinforced better and the uh, herniations will happen somewhere else. But for right now, in our lifetime, unfortunately, there's a design flaw. I wouldn't really call it a design flaw, but it is a design flaw where the weakest part of the annulus is right where the nerve exits. This is the superior facet we talked about. This is the pedicle. So let's go to the next slide. So, <laughs> Sean, yeah, we got to pay more attention. That's why we want to run through these things first. So, what happens when there's a failure of the an? Really, it's annulus, okay? What happens is the annulus tears. And the jelly, remember the nuclear jelly I told you about? It pushes out through the tear. Now, you're wondering, probably... Dr. Dickmajan, why are these edges not like touching each other here? Sure, there's a tear, but why are they not touching each other? How did this pink stuff get in here? The pink stuff got in there by squeezing because you're lifting things during the day, bending, twisting. You put pressure on the disc, it pushes the jelly out, just like squeezing a jelly donut or squeezing toothpaste out of a toothpaste bottle. When you put pressure on the wall, it squeezes the jelly out. And that pressure comes from lifting, bending, twisting, those types of activities, you know. And that pushes the jelly out and it separates the tear. Well, this is the essence of why annular tears become painful. This edge here wants to grow back across and attach to this edge. Okay, if you cut your skin and you leave it alone, the skin edges will heal and the two edges will come together and they'll grab each other and hold on and it'll form new skin, okay? The disc is the same way. The annulus wants to regrow back in and reattach, but it can't because this jelly is stuck in the middle. And what ends up happening is you get inflammation in this annular tear. And that inflammation then causes little nerves to grow in that are pain nerves. And so this whole area right here becomes a source of back pain or neck pain. This is what I fix with the Duke Laser Disc Repair. Right here. I use my laser to clean these edges up, get rid of the bad painful nerves, clean this edge up, and get rid of the jelly. So I get rid of the interposed herniation or jelly. I debride one side of the tear. I debride the other side of the tear, and I get rid of the painful nerves. I do all that endoscopically with a seven millimeter incision or a four millimeter incision in the neck. Let's go to the left picture. You can see the same thing. You get a tear in the annulus and the jelly squeezes out. Also here on the MRI scan, you can see this gray stuff is that jelly. The center of the disc is gray color and that's what you're seeing here is a herniation with interposed nuclear material. Do I still have everybody? I hope I do. We haven't lost anybody yet. So just, just kind of reviewing one more time, diagnostic testing for herniated discs. The best test is an MRI. MRIs don't tell you where pain comes from. 
uh, but a discogram will. And we did a discogram today in our laser patient at L45, and she had horrible 10 out of 10 pain when I injected dye. That tells me that the disc is the source of her pain. This is what a discogram looks like if you're doing um, L5S1, L45, L34. Notice that L34 is a cotton ball. There's no tear back here. L45, there's a big juicy tear in the back of the annulus and the dye is leaking out through the tear and the herniation. Same thing in L5S1. These two discs we could fix with fusion or we could fix with laser surgery. We're not going to talk about SI joint injections. All right. Let's ask a poll question. This one you all should be experts at. What is the name of the nerve carrying pain directly from the inflamed facet joint to the brain? Is it the medial branch of the dorsal ramus? Is it the L5 nerve root, the dorsal root ganglia, or the sympathetic trunk? Do -de -do 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 -de -do. Do I tell them or not? Do we wait? Give them just a second. All right, I'll give you guys some time. In the meantime, I'm going to move on to the next cause of common cause of lower back pain. It really doesn't cause back pain per se, but it causes buttock pain. At the top of the buttock, there's a muscle that runs from the tailbone all the way over to the hip bone. It's called the piriformis muscle. And if you get a tear in that muscle, which is pretty easy to do, that tear will cause buttock pain, but it can also irritate the sciatic nerve and cause pain to shoot down your leg. So what do we do? We do a diagnostic block. We inject that torn muscle with some medicine and see, does it take the patient's pain away? Usually it does, as long as you made the right diagnosis. And then you want to do some physiotherapy to let that muscle heal and get fixed. That's what the muscle looks like with the needle in it, injecting the dye. <coughs> we call this a myogram. And most of you will recognize the hip joint in the background, the pelvis, the sacrum, the sacroiliac joint, just for reference. All right, we have an answer. What's our answer? So we have Magnus on Facebook. He says his answer is A. Oh, Magnus, I'm so proud of you. So Magnus got it right. Magnus from Facebook, thank you for participating. Medial branch of the dorsal ramus is the correct answer. Great job. Let me do a question from one of our audience members. Let's, we have a question. So let's take a moment, pause, and answer our audience question. So we were discussing the strength of the disc and the annular tear. One of our viewers, Ali on uh, Periscope, has asked, does prednisone do anything to weaken the disc? I take 25 milligrams daily. So Ali is asking us, does the use of steroids such as prednisone weaken the disc? And it's a great question. I'm having to stop and think about it for a moment because honestly I haven't really thought about that. If I had to conjure up an answer right now, I would say no, it doesn't. Prednisone and steroids would not weaken the disc. Um, that being said, and I base that on my experience, but I also base it on everything I've read and studied. I've never seen anyone show that prednisone would weaken the disc. It doesn't mean that there hasn't been a scientist that's proven that. I'm just not aware of it. There are probably a million publications out there related to the spine. So to be honest with you, I'm not aware that prednisone weakens the disc. But um, that being said, I can't say 100%. So if I were to give my opinion, I would say 99.5%. I'm certain prednisone does not weaken the disc. Okay. Great question, though. Getting back to our presentation, the next thing we'll talk about are what are called spinal cord stimulators. These are becoming more popular. This is a treatment. It's a treatment offered by many doctors around the world. Um, they also called neuromodulators. Basically, what we're doing is we're putting, if you think about what a pacemaker is, a pacemaker is a wire with electrodes connected to a battery that goes into your heart. It zaps the heart and causes the heart to contract according to the pacemaker, right? So if you set your pacemaker for 60 beats a minute, the heart will it'll send electrical impulses 60 times a minute, and your heart will beat 60 times a minute. They've taken pacemakers basically and adapted them to put in the spine over the spinal cord. And what they do is they actually send electrical signals through the spinal cord. 
And the idea there is that it'll disrupt the signals of pain that normally travel up the spinal cord from your lower back and your legs, the pain down there, travel up the spinal cord to your brain. So the idea is that these, these wires and battery will actually stop the transmission of pain signals. Do they work? Sometimes, uh, but many times they don't. Okay, this is a good one. Sean has been uh, a busy little beaver coming up with tough questions. I like it. I had to think about it for a minute myself. So the poll question, again, is what part of the herniated disc causes back or neck pain? Is it the ventral annulus? The ventral annulus is the part of the annulus that's in the front of the disc, the front part. Is it the nucleus propulsus? Does the nucleus cause pain? Is it that? Is it the annular tear? Or is it the nerve root? So we'll give the audience a minute or two to choose which answer is correct. What part of a herniated disc is the cause of the back or neck pain? Is yeah. it? We have a guess from Magnus. He says C. Magnus. Magnus again. I like it. I like the name. Great name. All right. Magnus is saying answer C. Thank you, Magnus, for participating. And I will say you are correct. It is the annular tear. All right. We're almost done with the presentation and we'll take more questions uh, at the end. What is spinal fusion? So spinal fusions, one million spinal fusions done every year in the United States. Uh, about 300 to 400,000 are done on the neck. The rest are done on the back and the thoracic spine. There's starting to be more spinal fusions done with the sacroiliac joints. I'm not a big advocate at all for sacroiliac joint fusion. I don't think it's necessary. I think it's being done unnecessarily. Why do I say that? Well, number one, I do believe the sacroiliac joint is a cause of pain. For sure, it's 100% causes back pain when it gets inflamed. But the treatment we recommend is not fusion. We recommend injection with steroids and therapy. And it's not just any therapy. It's therapy specifically directed at the sacroiliac joint. We're talking about special kinds of stretches that are done daily to break up the scar tissue in the joint. That reduces the inflammation over time along with the steroids it allows people to, to walk normally without sacroiliac joint pain. So there's another option to do after the steroid shots and the therapy if it keeps coming back and that is a rhizotomy. Go in there with a needle and dent in the pain nerves. But the most dangerous of all treatments would be a fusion of the sacroiliac joint. Why is it becoming more popular? Because unfortunately the fusion is done with metal pieces that are manufactured by big companies that want to make profits. And so they're pushing that onto surgeons to do it, and the surgeons are doing it. The surgeons get paid a handsome fee to do sacroiliac joint fusions. So for those of you out there, if you're recommended for an SI joint fusion, please take advantage of Duke Spine Institute's free MRI review service, free Skype consultation. Talk to me. I'll be happy to meet with you, review your films, and I'll tell you whether or not I think you need a fusion of your sacroiliac joint. As a matter of fact, any fusion at all, talk to me. I'm happy to give you my opinion as to whether or not you need it done. So what are fusions? Fusions are really the act of getting one bone to grow together with a second bone. And these bones are generally located next to each other, one bone next to the other. And what's separating those bones normally is a joint. So if you think about it, these are bones that are supposed to be moving, and that joint's supposed to be moving. But what you're doing with a fusion is you're basically, physiologically, anatomically, you're eliminating the joint. You're getting rid of it. Why would you do that? Well, for many, many years, that's all we had to get rid of joint pain was to fuse bones together and get rid of the joint. If you had a painful joint and it hurts you to use it, if you fuse the bones together, it doesn't move anymore and it doesn't cause the pain. It's actually the movement of two bones at a painful joint that causes pain. So for example, if you had bad arthritis in your knee and you just sit in the couch all day and put your knee up and your leg up and you don't move it, 
the pain will go away. That's why people with arthritis, they lose their function. They can't walk, they can't you know, have hobbies, they can't do their jobs right because movement hurts. It's the movement of the painful joint that hurts. So a long time ago, somebody figured out, why don't we fuse painful joints in the spine? This is probably 50 years ago. They started fusing painful joints in the spine. Of course, the early fusions didn't work well. Why? Because the fusions actually didn't take. But then we developed very good ways of fusing bones, very efficient ways of fusing bones. I was part of that. I was trained on the most efficient ways of fusing bones in the spine. That surgery is called, a, in the lumbar spine, is called a uh, 360 fusion. Basically, you're fusing the inner body space, which is the disc, and you're fusing the back of the spine, which is called a posterior lateral fusion. So it's a combined anterior and posterior fusion. You do both sides of the spine. So it's a combination of an anterior fusion technique with a posterior, so you get a double whammy, much more likely to fuse. I will tell you that surgery works beautifully to get rid of people's pain. But now, why have that surgery if you can fix it with an arthroscopic or endoscopic procedure through a seven millimeter incision? That's what we're doing nowadays. So what you're seeing on this picture is basically screws and rods that hold the bones in place while the bones fuse, okay? Here's a good example of what I think is a problem with fusion in the neck. You can see the metal plate, the screws, one in this vertebrae, one in that vertebrae. Here's the graft right here, this big thing. Look at the end plate. The superior end plate is fractured. And this has caused what's called a wedge deformity of the vertebrae. Now, overall, this whole area of the spine from here is kinked forward. It's, it's, it's basically bad alignment of the spine. And that's going to create more problems and pain for the patient. So fusions cause problems down the road because a lot of times they're done in bad alignment. The doctor or surgeon didn't correct the alignment well, or the patient did things they weren't supposed to do. They fractured, and it causes a, uh, a spine that's supposed to be curved like this. It causes it to go that way, and that's bad. That causes horrible pain for the rest of the life, and it's very hard to fix. So thinking about all this, okay, this is you thinking, right? Hmm, what did I learn? Huh? Yeah, let's go. But starting to think about everything I've been telling you, you know, what are some of the disadvantages of fusion? There's one million fusions done a year in the United States. Uh, around the world, there's probably a total of about three million, if I'm guessing. Fusions are generally highly invasive surgery. Big incisions, big scars, very painful, long recovery, okay? And the recovery can, with fusion, if it's done well, can be three to six months. If you have a bad fusion, which is very common, a lot of surgeons don't do it right, it could be years. Fusions are expensive. They average about 150,000. They have a high complication rate. The complication rate for spinal fusions can be as high as 10, 20, even 50% I've seen. Some patients get a permanent impairment, obviously very high, and there's very expensive implants and biologic costs. Many people with a fusion will have a problem at the next disc above or below the fusion. It's called adjacent segment disease. Unfortunately, most every fusion has permanent work restrictions along with a loss of motion. This is what an old fusion surgery scar looks like. This is actually one of my patients. I think we did a three-level fusion here, L344551. Nowadays, we don't need to do fusion anymore. We do laser surgery, but this is only available in a few places in the world, like Duke Spine Institute. There's no bone removed, no implants, no biologics, no hospitalization. We don't even go to the hospital anymore for spine surgery. It's all done here outpatient. What do we call the pain coming from a herniated spinal disc? Is it called facet pain? Piriformis syndrome? Biliary colic? Or discogenic pain? All right. Remember, genesis means to create or originate. So I'll give you all a minute to answer. What do we call pain coming from a herniated disc? All right. What is this? Another question? 
What is the best way to treat chronic disc pain from a herniated disc? Is it pain medication, physical therapy, surgery on the disc, or shots? So I'll give you guys a minute to answer those. Let's go back. So what's it called when you have pain from a spinal disc? It's called discogenic pain. Disc, the origin. Genesis, where it comes from. Pain. So discogenic pain is pain coming from a disc. We have Amanda on Facebook who said the answer to the first question is D. B? D. Oh, D. Good, good job, Amanda. Good job. She, she answered correctly. Thank you. What is the best way to treat chronic disc pain? So if you've got back pain or neck pain, you've had it for several weeks, it's not going away, what's the best way to fix it? It's not pain meds or therapy. It's not shots. It's actually surgery on the disc. That's the only way it's going to go away. And that was the conclusion. All right. We are done with my little presentation. How come I can't go back to the pictures? We'll take any questions you might have. Otherwise, we'll wrap this session up. Once again, this is the first time we're doing this, and we want to do this every week. We really want to make it interactive. I want to answer your questions. Obviously, I don't have too many questions. When I do, I go get them answered myself. I look it up on PubMed or I do research. But I want to be a resource for you, for everyone out there that has concerns, questions, they need answers for whatever issue they're dealing with when it comes to the spine. Duke Spine Institute wants to be the ones providing you with the answers. Okay? A couple questions. I guess we have a few questions. So. Sean, you want to mention them? So we have Pam on Periscope who is asking, a doctor diagnosed with chronic lumbar radiculopathy and also a disc protrusion at L5. What exactly are my treatment options for this? Okay, one of our viewers says that they were diagnosed with chronic lumbar radiculopathy. What does chronic mean? Chronic it relates to time, how long you've had something, right? So chronic in medical terms usually means more than six weeks, all right? More than six weeks, eight weeks. There's no like strict definition at six and everybody agrees, but it's pretty much more than six weeks. So chronic means a condition you've had more than six weeks. Diabetes is gonna be lifetime for the most part. That's chronic, okay? Um, gout, chronic. Rheumatoid arthritis, chronic. These are all chronic diseases. They don't go away on their own. A broken bone, is not chronic. As long as it's treated properly and heals quickly, then it's acute. It, it happens and then it fixes and it's gone. So chronic radiculopathy means you've had the radiculopathy for more than two months. It's been going on for a while. Radiculopathy basically means nerve damage. Okay. So can I get back to those pictures? Yeah. I'm going to take you back to a picture that will help us understand what that means. I'm going to look for a picture real quick and we'll settle in on it. All right, here, this is a pretty good picture. Take a, take a look at the top here, top left. You see this disc right here? There's a herniation. This is where the jelly is pushed through an annular tear. Now, the yellow thing is the nerve, the nerve root, okay? And you can see here it says pinched nerve root, compressed or pinched nerve root. If we leave the nerve root pinched for a while, it's going to start causing damage to the nerve root. The reason is that the nerve root is very, uh, it's like wet pasta. It's, it's so easy. When you pinch it, it just pinches in half. That nerve root is very delicate. Nerves are delicate. The brain is delicate. All neurological structures are delicate. That's why it takes a special kind of surgeon to operate on them. You have to be trained to be delicate, basically. Long story short, when you have a pinched nerve, that's been pinched for a while, usually more than six weeks, uh, it causes nerve damage that is called chronic radiculopathy. So what are your treatment options? Well, I can tell you right now, you got to unpinch the nerve. That's the only way to get rid of it. So how do you unpinch the nerve? Okay, how do you unpinch the nerve? How do you get rid of this thing, this herniation pinching the nerve? That's where you've got options. And there's a lot of options. So you can to, for me to categorize your options, one option would be decompression alone. Another option would be decompression and fusion. 
But the very best option of all of them is the Duke Laser Disc Repair, endoscopic surgery. Here's why. A decompression, we'll call a microdiscectomy or laminectomy, which is very common. Most people's doctors will offer them that, is where the surgeon will come in. If you can see my arrow at the bottom picture, they'll come in here. This is fat, the white stuff. They'll peel this off, and this is a bone. The number six is a bone. It's called the... Uh, lamina and they'll lit the surgeon will literally drill this bone away or bite it away with with metal biters and remove it you're going to have a hole in your spine right here and then they'll come down here and they'll try to get this piece of herniation number two herniated disc they'll try to get it out that's actually a nerve root that's a nerve root number three is a nerve root the nerve root on the right side here is this one and you see how the herniation is pushing on the nerve root on the right side this is actually the right side so the traditional surgery that I was taught to do years ago that everyone else does in 2020, which I don't recommend, requires this whole bone here to be taken out. Well, once you take this bone out, this is the facet joint right here. That surgeon has to take part of your facet joint out. You don't want to lose part of your facet joint. There's nothing wrong with your facet joint. But they have to get rid of it in order to get this herniation out because they can't go through bone, so they have to take the bone out. That's the whole reason why we do what we do transforaminal with the laser surgery is to avoid taking bone out of your spine. So one option for you to do is a traditional microdiscectomy. I don't recommend it. You can also take the bone out and then fuse the bones together after you take the herniation out. That's a fusion. You don't want a fusion. You're losing movement. You're going to have complications. There's all kinds of problems. The best treatment in the world is to do the laser surgery that I showed you, the Duke Laser Disc Repair. It's the only surgery in the world that can get rid of the herniation, get rid of the tear, and let the disc heal properly without creating collateral damage. We have another question here from our audience. Stu on Periscope asks, do you have any specific thoughts on personalized 3D printed spine implants? So Stu is asking me, Dr. Duke Major, do you have any thoughts on this new technology that is 3D printed spinal implants? Um, Stu, you're not going to like my answer, but I'm being honest with you. I'm aware of 3D printed spinal implants. That technology is new. You're right. It's probably, I'd say, 8 to 10 years old now. And the God's honest truth is that it's kind of a marketing gimmick. It doesn't really add any value to the patient. There's really nothing, you know, there's no need for it, basically. I'm sorry, but that's the God's honest truth. The 3D sp uh, printed spinal implants include things like um, screws, rods, cages. Um, those are the main implants right now that are being done. And there's really no advantage, in my opinion, to uh, a personalized implant. We have trays of implants of different sizes. And those trays um, have, for example, cages that come in different sizes and shapes. So it's already customizable. And the difference between what's already available with rep respect to the different lengths and widths and heights, uh, which are already readily available, the, the difference is, in my opinion, insignificant. And the problem with 3D printed stuff is now you're, you know, you've got potential manufacturing defects that can occur. Whereas with the standard stuff, it's all standardized basically in a factory that's, you know, producing these implants in large numbers. Now you want to create individual implants. Well, that has to happen on an individual scale. So every single place you go will have to have a 3D printer. The, the materials used have to be vetted they have to be proper so basically you're taking mass production and you're making it individual production and you know for most things mass production like this most things like this i think mass production is better because you have better quality control measures in place now you're basically going to be opening up individualized personalized 3d printing you're going to be opening up Pandora's box to the potential that there's going to be a lot of quality control issues that go undiagnosed and then you got something in your body that falls apart. I personally would not want it. I would just want a standard construct. But then again, getting back to it, 
You don't want any of that. There's no need for 3D printed devices. The Duke laser disc repair surgery is all natural. There's nothing put in your body. You don't need anything printed at all. Right. We have another question from Sue on Facebook. She's wondering, can anyone go skiing after either a fusion surgery or a DL gun? So Sue, what's Sue's last name? Griffin. Sue Griffin. Hi, Sue. Nice to see you again. Nice to hear from you. Can anyone go skiing after back surgery or neck surgery when they have the Duke laser disc repair or they have a spinal fusion? The answer is yes, absolutely yes. Um, if you have a Duke laser disc repair, you're going to want to let that disc heal for at least six months to a year before you do skiing. If you've had a spinal fusion, you're going to want to let your spine heal for about the same amount of time, six months to a year before you do skiing. So. I'm 100% advocate for patients having spine surgery and then recovering properly, rehabilitating properly to strengthen the muscles to support the spine, and then doing very, very uh, aggressive activities. I don't believe people need to be limited in their activities based on the type of surgery they have. Now, we're making a big assumption, two of them. Number one, the surgery has to be done properly. And I can tell you many spine surgeons don't do the surgeries right. Number two, the patient has to be fully recovered and rehabilitated. So as long as those two criteria conditions are met, I think it's perfectly fine to go back to that type of activity, such as skiing. Next question. Next question is also from Sue, who has asked, if you have a damaged or pinched disc in your lower back, how often is it that that causes symptoms connected to the organs, such as the bowel? Great question. So thank you again for asking. One of our viewers is saying, if you've got a herniated disc in your lower back or a damaged disc in your back, how often could that cause symptoms related to your bowel? The answer is almost never. Now there's there is some rare conditions where a badly damaged disc can blow out and just release huge volumes of herniation to the point that they're crushing all your nerves. Then you'll see bowel dysfunction. And that bowel dysfunction will manifest itself as incontinence, where you'll be pooping on yourself, soiling your underwear. Uh, but never really constipation. It's always incontinence. But again, you need to have a very unusual, very, very unusual herniation or problem with the, with the disc where it would cause severe impingement of all the nerve roots. We call that cauda equina syndrome. Cauda, C-A-U-D-A, equina, E-Q-U-I-N-A syndrome. Look it up. Uh, in my entire career of 22 years, I've probably seen it 10 times, maximum 10 times. So it's extremely rare. Um, I would say that the treatment of a herniated disc with medication, such as narcotics, would be more likely to affect your bowels or someone's bowels as an indirect effect from the treatment with medication rather than a direct effect of the disc herniation on nerves causing bowel dysfunction. I hope I answered that. And our last question before we wrap it up here is from Teddy on Facebook who asks, what is the likelihood of a ruptured disc healing itself with nothing but rest? So Teddy on Facebook has asked Dr. Duke, what's the likelihood of a ruptured disc healing itself without doing anything but just taking it easy and resting? Teddy, I would say the chances are really good, probably about 95%. 95% of people with a ruptured disc can heal their disc on their own. But here's the caveat, two things. Number one, if that person has any symptoms that would be related to spinal cord or nerve damage, they should not wait. They should go get surgery. Okay. Do not wait. It won't heal on its own. So those symptoms would include balance difficulty, incontinence of urine or feces, 
um, numbness or tingling going into the arms and hands, uh, weakness in the arms or legs, drop foot where they can't pick their foot up or leg up because they've got weakness, severe numbness or tingling in the arms or feet. Those are all symptoms that are more than just a herniated disc. They're signs of damage to neurological structures like the spinal cord and nerve roots. Do not wait in that case. But let's assume your only symptom is pain. Neck pain, back pain, thoracic pain. Is it safe to wait? Yes. And what's the likelihood the pain will go away? About 95%. The second caveat, which I haven't talked about yet, is time. How much time do you give it to heal? A lot of people wait too long. What I would say to you is if you have a herniated disc causing pain and you want to know is it going to heal on its own, if it's past six weeks, it's not going to heal on its own. If you have pain from a herniated disc past six weeks, you're going to need to get some other treatment done, like surgery on the disc. That was our, only other question. That was our last question. I'm Dr. Arajik Majin, CEO and founder of Duke Spine Institute here in Melbourne, Florida. Hope you've enjoyed our webinar today. And we're going to be back next week with more surgeries that are live and testimonials from patients who have had back or neck pain for years and have gotten, gotten that pain fixed here at Duke Spine with our advanced cutting edge technologies. We'll also have a webinar next week on Thursday is what we're planning to do and bring your questions and bring your topics. Feel free to post if you have a topic you want me to talk about. Until then, download the Duke Spine Institute app for free. Join the Spine Surgery Support Group on Facebook, and we can answer more questions for you. Be safe, and um, enjoy your weekend. Nice job.